So hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our session. Um, grafting blockchains into enterprise businesses, um, the legal entity identifier and digital verifiable credentials. I'm Carla McKenna from the Global Legal Entity Identifier Foundation, here with my colleague, Christoph Schneider, and one of our partners um, in development, um, Business Reporting Advisory Group, um, with Michael Pahatsky here um, from BREG. Now it doesn't work. There we go. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on what is a legal entity identifier. So um, many of you may not, may not know the origins of a legal entity identifier. Um, it came to be um, because of the financial crisis back in 2008. Um, it's actually an identifier that the global regulatory community led by the Financial Stability Board actually wanted established so that um, legal entities and their activity could be traced. Think for um, derivatives transactions and other, other types of, of activity that actually caused the financial crisis. So the legal entity identifier um, is um, an initiative in order to be able um, to establish a registry of legal, of legal entity identifiers along with um, reference data both entity reference data and some relationship um, reference data about these types um, of, of entities. Uh, the LEI itself is an ISO standard. Um, it's a code um, stood up by uh, a standard set of reference data that's defined um, in the ISO standard itself. And we run the Global LEI Foundation. We run a repository of these, these codes um, and the attendant reference data that's open to and free to any LEI data user and, <clears throat> excuse me, accessible by um, Open Charter and also downloadable and, and accessible in many ways. So what does the LEI have to do with the digital world? Now the LEI itself is an unambiguous and permanent identifier for a legal entity. And so tied to its reference data and the fact that it's permanent, unique, can't be assigned again, it actually can be um, an identifier for that particular organization um, throughout, its, throughout its life. Now we've taken a look at the, the LEI in, in two parts of the digital world. So we've embedded LEIs in standard X509 digital certificates. Um, and use those to be able to sign content and documents. And then um, we became involved and, and became familiar with the self-sovereign identity world domain, which is, was completely new for us, as the LEI was to the self-sovereign <laughs> identity domain. So we found each other, um, in effect, and, and saw that we might be able to benefit from getting together. And we ran two proofs of concept, um, one on Ethereum and one on Hyperledger, because uh, the LEI is agnostic as to the kind of technology that, that it would run on. Uh, we're trying to be able to prove that it can be an anchor for digital identity uh, in, in this particular case. And so um, we propose that uh, the LEI can be part of uh, digital verifiable credentials as they are as part of digital certificates. And um, we we then add on to that that the LEI can be um, a center of the uh, decentralized verification process. Um, that's part of digital verifiable credentials. So digital identity in the LEI is based on these three concepts. You have an organization or legal entity. You have a person or persons who are associated or related to um, that entity in some ways. And within those organizations, those people have roles. And so we take this information and we try to be able to put it together in some sort of standard way. The representation of the organization or legal entity is the LEI itself, the person's legal name as part of the credential, and the official role that they play. And by putting all of these three together, we form the foundation of the POCs and the concepts that we were trying to prove in the POCs. We started to talk with our partners um, about the concept of organizational wallets rather than individual wallets. The organizational wallet is kind of, in our minds, almost a melding of individual and organizational data around a person. So you get an organizational credential um, by being part of a legal entity, 
um, being an employee, being a CEO, um, having some sort of official role um, within that, that organization. And there is also information about you as a person um, can, can be in that credential as well. And so we, we, we see this as the basis. We started very simple the legal entity identifier, the legal name, and the official role in the role credentials um, in, in effect, and then that can be added on as necessary. So what we're gonna describe to you, and I'm gonna turn it over to Christoph in, in a moment, that the chain of trust starts with the Global LEI Foundation that is overseen and, and overseen and governed by global regulators around the world. So we have um, a regulatory mission, and that is tied to the financial crisis, but um, we see digital identity and the role for the LAI across domains, not just in financial services and not just in regulatory reporting frameworks. But Glyph anchors the chain of trust. We have a network of over 30 organizations that actually issue LEIs and collect the reference data that we put in the repository. We would grant them digital identity through some sort of accreditation process. We would then have the LEI issuers issue legal entity digital verifiable credentials to any holder of an LEI who wanted a digital identity. And then that legal entity would be free to create its organizational wallet for its own purposes, whether it just be for people with official discoverable roles in business registries or as part of just regular employee credentials. And then all of this can be accessed and verified by the LEI data user. And between Christoph and Michael, they will take you through the rest of this as to how this happens. So does this work? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Carla. Yes, it's working. All right. So um, let us look into more detail how this um, chain of trust works by exchanging digital verifiable credentials. And uh, we will briefly revisit the roles that Carla already introduced. So on the top of the slide, we have uh, Glyph, the Global LEI Foundation, who um, does part of the governance and the, um, the operational management of the LEI system. And as part of this, uh, accredits so-called LEI issuers, which you see on the right-hand side. Um, and we have 34 of them who, um, who do a global coverage. So wherever you're on the planet, uh, with a legal entity, you can get an LEI from at least one of those organizations. Um, and on the other hand, on the left-hand side, we have the legal entities. These are the owners of LEIs. Currently, we have some good one and a half, um, one and a half million of them. And uh, at the bottom is the LEI data user who wants to consume the LEI data, the reference data, and identify legal entities. This is what it is about. And um, it all starts at the top with Clive who, um, in our scenario, would receive a digital credential from, um, from a trusted framework, in this case, Sovereign, um, which basically just uh, tells you that Glyph is Glyph um, and is able to digitally accredit LEI issuers. And that's what we're doing in the next step. So with this, Glyph is able to provide a digital verifiable credential to an LEI issuer who those who want to participate, and that basically tells you they are an accredited LEI issuer on the one hand, and on the other hand, they are able to issue digital LEIs. But we'll get there in a moment. So, what already happens today and is not new is that LEI issuers um, issue LEIs to legal entities. That's a very normal thing. It happens about 1,000 times per day. Um, but now legal entities, if they're working with an LEI issuer who is uh, an, a digitally accredited one and has such a credential, they can request also their digital LEI based on um, the usual processes that we have already in place. So we're piggybacking on existing communication channels and processes here. Um, so there's, there's not a long way to go basically to, um, to be able to achieve this. So and based on such a request, um, the LEI issuer could in turn then issue the verifiable credential to the legal entity, who then can prove that it is that legal entity, leveraging their LEI, um, and do something in addition, because as we all know, legal entities themselves don't act in business processes, but it's human beings that act. So um, we have another role. These are the persons in official roles, which, um, which can then receive from their employers, so to speak, 
verifiable credentials that, um, that identify them as being part of the organization in a specific role and also authorize them to do specific things with that. So um, now everybody has their verifiable credentials. That's fine. Um, nobody knows about it. So um, there would be the potential to basically have a register on that by legal entities basically reporting back their issued credentials or the existence of these issued credentials to their LEI issuer in this federated system. Um, and then in turn, the LEI issuer could aggregate that and report that back to the GLIFE, which already has um, the so-called global LEI index, a central register of legal entities. And there could also be um, a lookup functionality for these publicly discoverable roles. So, but no use happened so far. And this is where I hand it over to Michael. So if you, if you think about it, it's the user basically that, that wants to get some information about the, uh, the roles and the, the persons, the people connected to specific legal entity with a specific assigned legal entity identifier. So, um, thank you, Kala. So here we've got a situation where, first of all, I need to discover what are those roles that a particular entity created for themselves. Let's say uh, we've got a CEO who assigns specific roles depending on the different functions of the organization or depending on the different types of projects or maybe further specific to uh, a particular legal circumstances, um, we need to discover those. So we want to uh, use a lookup function to see what roles were registered by the organization with the Global LDI Foundation. That's sort of like a little bit of an authoritative source for us about what can I know about individuals linked to this particular organization registered with the LEI uh, uh, registry, with the GLIFE registry. So the first thing that I need to do is I need to do the, a little bit of a lookup on, on the GLIFE website probably. Um, and the second thing I will need to do is I need to obviously uh, uh, check on the possibility of uh, or, or check the, the proof, so to say, of all these credentials that have been registered. So I want to verify, I want to ascertain that uh, these credentials that have been presented to me uh, are still valid. They have not been revoked. In business operations, quite naturally, as you can assume, we've got multiple of these and many of these situations where we uh, basically change because of the, of the movement and, 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 um, and the circulation or rotation of staff, uh, assignment of the different roles within the organization. So the fact whether something is up to date is absolutely critical when it comes to linking an organization to a specific uh, person in the, in the particular capacity, in the particular role assigned by the entity. So here we've got this entire notion of first looking up of what can I know about the particular entity and the, the linked uh, individuals, and further, uh, can I verify that all this is still up to date um, according to, uh, to the, the entire infrastructure. Um, and then we can basically uh, provide the, the requests, we can issue the, uh, uh, the verification uh, in those multiple, so to say, processes between the LEI data user, between the legal entity, and I can also get back to the entire chain um, up to GLIFE to see you know, whether the entire chain of trust that Carla was talking about is still valid, is still up to date. Um, that provides me um, a fairly powerful toolkit for verifying wh who am I dealing with, whether they do possess the credentials they claim. Uh, I can see what of which of these parts have been changed in the past. I can actually verify all these different circumstances of what the specific credential um, uh, assigns or allows the individual to do or represent in the context of a specific um, uh, entity. All that leads to a relatively large set of use cases in, in the business world, as you can probably imagine. Uh, so we, are, we have now enabled the process that links those entities that are grounded in the, in the uh, governance framework, that is an international governance framework of uh, the Global LEI Foundation, uh, of the LEI, and we have actually linked different types of individuals, we can discover them, we can see how they are related to the particular entity. What can we do about it? We will delve into that in a second, but before that, 
Uh, let's take a look at the technical architecture. We, we went through the entire process. So Carla walked us through the, the base and the background and then with Christoph through the entire process of the issuance of the DVCs according to the, the role of the issuance of the ADIs. Now we are at the moment where we can take a look at how the architecture looks like. And I would like to invite Christoph back to sort of like make it a little bit more interactive. And here, as you can see, we've, uh, we are actually particularly, I have to admit, lazy. So uh, we would not create something that exists already. We would actually reuse as much as possible the things that are built by smarter people around. So uh, in that sense, we have actually created those four layers. And first question maybe, because you're all familiar with those different components here. They are being spoken about sovereign foundation and the sovereign network, the Hyperledger Indy as the project of the entire Hyperledger uh, foundation, so to say. Uh, and then you are probably very familiar with the Evernim company and their, their developments, as well as the VON, uh, VON uh, network that John was speaking about. So all these components are familiar, but um, Christoph, if you could guide us a little bit why and, and uh, what role do these components play in our, um, in our projects? So for instance, why did we pick particularly Sovereign and, and Indy? Certainly. So um, as Carla mentioned already in the beginning of the presentation, Glyph um, is, uh, is not, uh, so, but is technology agnostic. So we're not a software company. We're having a specific use case here. And um, we, we were talking to several organizations. <laughs> And one of them um, was Sovereign, and uh, the, the obvious uh, software then was Hyperledger Indy because that's the one that was contributed by Sovereign to um, the Hyperledger Foundation in the end. So um, it is just, just one out of many, but this is the combination when we went to that. And on the, on the DVC management, why, you know, sort of like it's a layer that is in between, so to say, the, the use cases at the top and the, the, the backbone there. Uh, why did we have to sort of like bring it in? Um, I don't think we had to, but um, as you mentioned, we wanted to be lazy and basically uh, reuse existing functionalities instead of reinventing the wheel. Um, and um, as we had met uh, John um, from the British Columbia, uh, government um, who was who were already doing something similar with the one network um, we saw that there are existing functionality which really made it very easy to create uh, and have additional functions of verifiable credentials like a revocation um, so we were able with very little effort actually to create uh, the full functionality of this and a proof of concept without having to do a lot of software development so again, we're back to the lazy square and also to try to simplify. Now this has led us to, to provide a bit of a, um, a, a foundation, a mechanism to cater for different use cases. So let's delve a little bit into those different use cases. Thanks a lot, Christoph. So um, on the use cases, if, you, if I look back at that, when uh, Carla and Christoph approached our company to, to help with the entire uh, project and with the entire concept, we were back then already after delivery of another project uh, based on uh, blockchain. That was for the European Commission. A quick check, how many of you have heard of the European Financial Transparency Gateway? One, two, all right, lovely. So uh, you, the, the, the two colleagues in the audience over here, uh, but for the rest, it is as a project led by the European Commission, established by them, and it is actually a running project across 27 member states of the European Union, as you know, since the 1st of February 27. Um, we used to be a bit bigger. Uh, but, you know, it actually, contrary to the very common philosophy in Europe, which we apply always when we stumble upon a problem, what we do, we establish an organization to solve the problem, right? So here, contrary to that, the European Commission finally thought, well, we have a bit of a problem. The problem was uh, stemming from a piece of law called Transparency Directive. The Transparency Directive was basically requiring that each of the a listed company in registered in the different markets in uh, across the 27 member states they have to submit pieces of information such as annual reports and corporate actions reports to the registries established in each of these countries the registries were called officially appointed mechanisms interestingly those registries could be either private entities or public entities that could be could have been a central bank or a stock exchange or a securities commission or a business registry or an entirely private company 
So they, they had different diversified interests. So that was creating already a multi-stakeholder environment. And the problem from the transparency directive perspective was that it required that if I were an investor in Europe and I wanted to get access to all these annual reports of all the listed companies, I should have one single point of access. Uh, now, you may think of it as uh, pretty much before before United States became united, we've got close to 27 different languages. So if you look at the websites of each of the registries, you will find Croatian, Polish, Czech, etc., etc., all these different things, all different formats. It's a big mess. So from the investor perspective, no single point of access. We tried to convince the OEMs uh, in a traditional way. You know, let's sit together, let's put it all in a database because a technical solution is a database. Well, political problems aside um, um, uh, emerged, and these folks did not agree to do that. They said, we will never agree to put it into one single source. So the commission at that point of time came up with the idea, why don't we actually create a decentralized database that would synchronize itself? In this case, you will all be an owner of the part of the network. So they had a political argument to basically uh, 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 fence off these, these, these political, so to say, issues and say, well, we'll just create this network in such a way that each of you will become a node and you register not really the annual report that you receive, but the fact that you have received this annual report. So just some, create something like an index, like li old-fashioned library index that we approach, the, you know, the big card box with, we search that on this shelf we'll find this biology book, right? So that was pretty much it. And the, the EFTG was an interesting concept because it solved certain political problems and organizational problems with a decentralized technology. So we were after that when, when Carla and, and Christoph described how they are thinking about the vision of the, of the connection between the LEI and the DVC. And immediately, as a company, we started looking for all these cases where this really would apply. Um, now, if you think about it, there are Actually, the, the solution is relatively powerful. Um, and here, um, what we found out is it is powerful because we maybe a little bit unknowingly applied three principles of uh, a very famous local architect, well, actually not local, global, Frank Lloyd Wright. How many of you have been to the Taliesin West? Is it it? Highly recommended. It's a beautiful place. And the, the, the gentleman is very well known as an acknowledged architect. What he has been always doing and, and sort of like uh, promoting across his life were three things. First of all, simplify and focus on the particular problem when you're trying to sort of like sort out the, uh, 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 the challenge. Here, Carla and Christoph define the problem. How do I prove in a digital world that I, Michal Piechotsky, am a CEO of BRAG? Very simple. How do I prove that? Right? From the perspective of the SSI, it's not only that I issue my own self-sovereign identity and self-sovereign credential. I need to be somehow grounded to the entire environment. And here comes the second principle of Frank Lloyd Wright. You need to look at the environment. And the environment has legal aspect, has certain governance aspect, uh, the governance framework, for instance, of the ADI, the organizational framework, and so on. So I need to, we needed to sort of like respect that and implement that in part of the solution. And thirdly, the, uh, the solution pretty much is by nature decentralized because LEI is applied all globally. So, and even in this, those cases that I was talking about, the, the EFTG, we combined LEI, but it was still, you know, sort of like global solution. So what we had to cater for is the need for this to organically grow. So what we needed to focus on is the structure, is the foundation. And here comes this third principle of Frank Lloyd Wright, focus on the structure so that actually the entire set of use cases can grow organically. We did that. If you look at these use cases over here, the solution that has been built, uh, that was built and that, that is pretty much you know, sort of like operational in this pilot stage, I could call it this way, uh, we are right now de debating variety of these different use cases. Let me focus on a couple of them. So first of all, regulators who need to get access to information about who is submitting reports. Uh, in most of the regulatory frameworks, someone is actually designated to, uh, to, to submit these sort of like compliance reports and be the contact point for the regulator. In those cases, we are talking, and, and many of these regulations around the world are already employing 
LEI as the identifier for companies that need to be supervised or monitored by the regulators. So here we are having a very clear use case for a global solution, very simple one based on these wallets of uh, the DV LEI DVC. Client onboarding, if you are a bank and you need to verify things uh, about the new, so to say, person or, or entity, here it is a very clear use case. We've got a decentralized system, we've got distributed sources of information. We need to sort of like collate it all into one particular view that will work also in the context of all the AML regulations and CFT regulations. So from this perspective, again, we have a clear, so to say, need for the application of this particular type of solution. Is it possible to be sorted out with other types of solution? Maybe, but this seems to be one of the very, very efficient ones in those use cases. Um, if you're looking at this sort of like trade supply um, and supply chain thing, uh, I should not even speak about it because the colleague from, I think, Chain Yard was presenting just a moment ago, and he beautifully described how, how this is working. The only thing is, you know, you need to connect it again to the so to say, organizational framework to the policies framework, and the policies framework in our case is actually connected to the ADI. So if you combine these pieces of, of uh, the supply chain on the uh, trade partner supply chain verification on the network plus the LEI, you get actually the entire, so to say, um, um, structure that Frank Lloyd Wright is talking about that enables all these use cases to, be, to, to pop up. Um, then uh, if we are talking about things like a trusted supplier and the verification, um, in Europe, uh, one of the big things is, for instance, whether uh, we have green, so to say, suppliers. So there are lots of funds being given by the European Union, and the question is, how can we verify that, for instance, an investment is green, and so on, and how can we verify that someone who provides uh, this particular investment uh, idea or, or plan is actually certified by all these different parties as required by law. So these are all the types of cases where, which can be built upon LEI DVC. We've got a clear identification of a company, we've got a clear link to individuals, and the DVCs are flexible, as we, we've heard before. Payment system membership, I need to be a payment, I need to certify that I'm meeting all these different requirements. That, that comes back to the entire meta use case of fit, uh, 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 fit and proper, pretty much. So here, all the type of use cases of fit and proper, uh, when an individual needs to be verified in context of the legal entity, can be, can be uh, supported by, the, by, this, by this relatively simple mechanism. Um, one of these that, uh, uh, one of these that uh, I find partic particularly interesting is um, uh, the one about the general data protection regulation. Uh, those of you who are aware how the GDPR works, um, even in my company, we had to do it this way, that we had to nominate someone in order to, for instance, process personal data of our employees, personal data of our clients, personal data of, of uh, uh, partners, and so forth. Now, who is who is delegated to do that and who has the credential on behalf of the company to, for instance, contact the authorities in case of incidents and all these kind of uh, situations is precisely the use case for the LEI DVC. My company is identified and then all the individuals whom I assigned rights in order to, to perform certain functions on behalf of the company, they are clearly identified. I can revoke these uh, rights in case an employee situation changes and so on or my, my, uh, upon my decision. So again, these use cases are possible because of setting up this entire structure. And so finally, uh, so to say, summing up the structure, um, we can look at it from the perspective of the value of, of implementing of this uh, LEI, of implementation of this LEI DVC for the variety of these use cases. So what we are gaining? We are gaining clear identification of the legal entity. So that is the component that Carla was uh, uh, referring to. We, we, we exactly know what entity it is. If you move back for a second to the use cases, think of all these issues that we are having with tax havens and shell companies. How do you identify the, so to say, beneficial owner in a case of business registers? We need to register those beneficial owners. But what happens when you have shell company upon shell company upon shell company upon shell company and also distributed across geographical tax havens? How do you actually 
link all these to create this sort of like to know exactly the chain of trust and the final beneficiary who could be individual X, Y, Z. Right? So, so we are talking about this sort of like clear value of knowing exactly what legal entity are we specifically talking about. But that's not enough because we need to uh, know exactly how this entity spreads the right to represent across the individuals. We need to somehow link, and this is the beautiful part of the solution that I like, um, in business, and my company, for instance, for 15 years has been trying to establish more transparency in, in the regulatory world and so forth. One of the big concepts, big trouble that we've stumbled upon is how do you actually link accountability? And how do you build accountability in this business? You know, think back to the crisis and think back to the, so to say, uh, the, the possibility to, um, to apply this accountability to individuals who have been in charge of certain operations and who should be maybe, you know, tried uh, uh, or, or at least questioned in the context of specific actions. It's very difficult to hold this accountability because you, you, the, the chain of command pretty much and the chain of trust is so dissolved. Now here we are establishing it back, we are bringing a little bit more integrity to this chain and more connection between the individual. So the control by the legal entity to establish this organizational wallet of DVCs, but at the same time possibility to verify it and prove it with all the different stakeholders, that is bringing this another big powerful value component to the, to the solution. And finally, uh, and this is what, what Christoph was, was uh, describing to us, how it works, how this issuance and, and proof process works. And finally, this is this um, secure, decentralized identification management and verification. So again, we are talking about this back to the, to the so to say, Frank Lloyd Wright, organic thing. We have considered the environment, the environment you know, has mountains over here, has a lake over here, has a couple of trees over here. We're not gonna cut those trees and, you know, sort of like cover the lake and ignore the mountain. We're actually gonna build the house in such a way that we can admire the mountain, we can actually benefit from the lake. And, well, the tree, in the case of Frank Lloyd Wright, he actually even established a wall around the tree. He wouldn't cut it. Literally, there's a, a tree in the house. We don't need to be so dramatic and, 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 you know, sort of like particularly radical about the solutions, but, on, in, in this sense, from the business perspective, we need to consider that there is this uh, legal organizational framework that we need to cater for, and there is this sort of like framework of organizations that we need to spread the use case across, and this, these use cases will be diversified. So again, the organic growth of these use cases, that's the value of the solution that uh, we, we, we hope that this is the value of the solution that we have built. And here I would like to also acknowledge and thanks to, to all the different organizations that were listed because without you know, uh, Sovereign, without uh, Hyperledger, without VON developments, it wouldn't be possible. So it's, it's a truly collaborative piece of work where all these things led to a structural solution. Thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Right in front of you. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> yeah. You're forgetting your friend Lloyd Wright. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, okay. I should. Um, uh, are you planning to do anything with uh, Aries? Uh, because that's the latest wallet uh, being developed. Uh, you know, I don't know whether you're going to do Aries. We haven't, I don't, I am not familiar with that. I don't know, Christoph, if this is maybe a question to you, uh, yeah. because... Can, can yeah. I be heard? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're, this is uh, one proof of concept that we did, but uh, we did others, and we're also continuing to do additional ones, and one of the upcoming ones actually considers areas as the wallet technology, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let Carla uh, answer that. Um, sure. Um, actually, if we could go back. Yep. Can I have the clicker thing? Please. Thank you. No, 
what did I do? Uh, you can go back. Yep, let's just go back there. There we go. So Glyph doesn't issue any LEIs. Um, we, we take information and, and we, we distribute it um, in the repository and um, form the, the governance under regulatory oversight for the whole system. The LEI issuers issue LEIs and can also issue digital LEIs. Um, once it gets to the legal entity, we prefer to, to call them persons in official roles because individuals sometimes can be confused with natural persons. And so that's not within the scope of legal entity identifier. But what we want to be able to get to is we want to get to Christoph as the head of IT, Michael as the CEO of BRAG, Bill Gates as a beneficial or, or um, as a beneficial uh, owner um, for for a certain company, for example, um, also a corporate insider, um, and, and and other roles, board advisor, board chair. So you're taking the person, and you're in effect combining it with their organizational persona. Uh, so, uh, again, the question regarding the uh, role per se, the, the last layer. So, is it possible for individuals, especially with private companies, to opt out of that disclosure, especially if they are not part of the CXO roles? And this, uh, the, the addition to the question is who will be liable? We, we face that now. That, that really has um, that, that's an, that's an issue with LEIs just um, existing now, as opposed to digital LEIs. So the system was stood up on a principle of self-registration. So um, all of the registrants are responsible and sometimes mandated, depending on what kind of activity they're doing, to get an LEI and to keep it up to date. Um, we're putting a number of things in place. Well, we have something in place. We have a challenge facility where any LEI user can come in and actually challenge a piece of data on the LEI system. It goes back to the managing LEI issuer and they need to research it and they need to fix it if it's wrong. And the other thing that we're doing is the regulators have issued a policy. These are the pronouncements that the, our, our oversight committee um, looks at. And they want us to implement a selected list of what we in the industry call corporate action events, but they're calling them legal entity events. So they've picked a subset of, of, of corporate events that could or should have uh, changes or updates made to either entity level data or relationship level data. And when we have that in, um, that there'll be much more of a responsibility in order to be able to, to report on those changes and, and the updates that would, would need to be made because of legal entity events. The other thing that we hope that if this take, takes off, just the business value and the digital identity value of wanting to know that the, the data about a company that you want to do business with or that a, a regulator needs to accept a filing from will automatically up the timeliness and the data quality of the global LEI system. So we, we really want to make that a driver. So, so the business case chases the, the technology, not the other way around. So. If you think about the LEI, just to add one, one uh, comment to Carla's uh, 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 answer. Um, the, for instance, I, again, I'll bring the, the, the example from Europe. The LEI itself is a little bit like a distributed mechanism. You know, so so the, the, its strength relies on the strength of the nodes operating it. And sometimes the policies are actually enforcing or uh, empowering the nodes to, to be uh, so to say, very, very uh, particularly, uh, how shall I say that, uh, enforcing or, or bringing up uh, the, the, the value of the LEI and the, the quality of it. Uh, if I look back at ESMA mandates, 
uh, the European Securities Markets Authority, especially for trading of OTC derivatives and so on. If you don't, if you don't have an LEI, you're effectively excluded from the system. So, you know, from this perspective, the, again, the power comes from a regulator uh, considering LEI in the context of their particular business that they wanted to, to, to achieve. We have a number of those cases uh, happening there. Hopefully, when this proliferates, so more of the regulators and more of the uh, private businesses consider the LEI and in parallel consider, for instance, the LEI DVC, we will get, you know, the stronger we'll get, uh, the more we'll get of these, these implementations, the stronger the network will get and the stronger the pressure on the, on the particular entity to also uh, correct and so on. Sorry. I, I can't confirm that, but there, of, of course, a, across the EU, it, 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 it makes sense. 27 member states, transparency, aggregation, um, prudential supervision, you know, you can come up with a list this long as to the facilitation that the LEI um, would, would give for the identification across languages, across boundaries, across different kinds of regulators. So um, it's, it's certainly... Um, Mm. Yeah. The problem in Europe is that we, we are implementing LEIs uh, per regulation, which, which is not ideal. We should have it as the overarching thing, but there are still some competing approaches and so on. It's a reality in Europe. We, we have those different things. Um, so I think that will Germany actually push for one particular approach? I, working with all these regulators for, for those past years, I would prefer to say, or I, I think that it, it's more likely that we will see the critical mass growing, and at some point of time it, it will not make any sense to go other way than LEI. The question is how long the critical mass will take. Right now we've got some of these, like the, as I said, the emir Mifir uh, frameworks, they are strong frameworks, uh, but these frameworks are strong with limited number of entities. Uh, so, so here we are talking about massive volumes of money, like you know, six or 700 billion euro in, in the OTC derivatives market, so significant contribution to the EU economy, but very limited number of entities which this really applies to. Whereas there are other cases like, for instance, ESEF, uh, the European Single Electronic Format, uh, which is part of the Transparency Directive, where you have only 5,000 entities ready, issued the LEIs, but frankly speaking, it pertains to thousands of people dealing with annual reports and creating them and auditing them and verifying them and so on. So we have much bigger base of individuals and, and entities in this particular context. Um, there's also the LEI was designed to be a, a, a super identifier um, in effect. Not to necessarily replace at the beginning um, the national identifiers, the business registry codes, anything like that, but something that could be mapped to them. Also, for the operational side of things, to be mapped to the business identifier code, the BIC, um, for transactional purposes. And at some particular point in time, or even mapped within an organization for any internal codes that they may have, but at some particular point in time when this critical mass happens, we're hoping to see a shift as to why maintain all of these levels and why not just use the LEI? Drummond. Can you tell us more about uh, how roles, if you're going to be assigning them in, in LEIs, how those roles are going to be defined? The, you brought up governance before as, as well and, and, and who's responsible for what. Um, at this particular point, we have a governance framework over the LEI system, but we have not constructed a governance framework for issuance of DVCs. Um, we actually appreciate, if I could call it that, the flexibility of DVCs in order to be able to design the schema for whatever purpose you need at that particular point. So, so the responsibility in order to be able to describe the use um, and, and for whom DVCs will be issued, we've left right now entirely with the legal entity in our proofs of concept at this particular point. We do see some what would I call it, um, ability to, to um, 
to come together. We've actually made uh, an, an application to ISO uh, to come up with an official organizational role standard. So you would have a role that would be identified that would be applicable to a particular jurisdiction or more than one jurisdiction in a particular language. So for example, you know, Stefan Wolf, CEO of Glyph, he's really not a CEO. He's whatever the equivalent of a CEO is in Basel. So in German um, type of thing. So, um, so we're, we're hoping to be able to provide more standardization um, and, really, and really on, the, on, on when I put the three, the three up, at this particular point in time, it's whatever anybody wants to put in. We'd like to be able to get those official roles standardized, but then we'd also like to leave the flexibility for um, a, a legal entity to be able to describe any kind of employee, even if they're only authorized to sign business contracts. Here, uh, an interesting, so to say, uh, 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 spin-off from this question is, how do you tie it to the legal frameworks? Because the, the roles are defined by the legal framework. And according to Polish law, I'm a prezes zarządu, which would be a chairman of the board. But in small companies, you don't even need a board. It, it's just basically one person. So it would be an equivalent of a CEO in other countries. Now, CEO is an unofficial role. Typically, you don't find it in a law. Um, or you may find it, uh, for instance, in the US, but if you look at French law, I don't think they have anything that would be an equivalent to the CEO. So again, we, we will have different types of uh, roles stipulated by the law, and the, the impact of that on the credentials of the particular row, uh, law, uh, role are typically significant. So we need to somehow you know, consider this tie back to the regulation. To give you an illustration, just in Europe, we were performing certain uh, projects for the past three years comparing regulations uh, in, in 23, I think, different types of regulatory frameworks. There are 11 ways in which lawyers across the European Union call for annual frequency of reporting. And it, it might sound funny because it's like, you know, annually or uh, once a year or at least once a year or yearly and so on. It might sound trivial. But if you think about it, when we asked the CROs of the companies, the question was, okay, so what do I do? As a CRO, CRO I turn to my lawyer for interpretation. Because I could report numbers at the end of the year, end of fiscal year, end of calendar year, if once a year maybe I pick an average, maybe I pick a particular date in a year, each of that would be you know, probably justifiable in one way or another, especially if I have a good lawyer. So from this perspective, this really impacts the numbers that I report. The same way this tiny differences in the role description may actually significantly impact my credentials as the, as, as the, the possibility to act. Who is? We're still in formation mode there, um, in, in trying to figure out um, the, the details, um, basically. We're to the point of um, spreading the word about the LEI, what it stands for, how it can marry with the digital world, and all of the work that you, you people are doing um, on a daily basis, and you know, trying to bring these together and bring the best of both, of both, of both together. Um, we, we have conducted the POCs on mostly um, people contributing their own time and resources um, to being able to prove this concept with, of course, having some licensing you know, um, money to have to, to put up in order to be able to use some of the tools. But um, we're still in awareness and demonstration mode and understanding mode um, at this point, but, but we are beginning conversations throughout 2020 in order to be able to say, um, how do we solidify some of these roles, um, in effect, in, in these ecosystems if we stand them up? And, and what, does, what does life look like um, in, in the future 
um, of these? What's the appropriate role or roles for us to play? Just, you know, so if you think about it from the structure perspective, again, Frank Lloyd Wright, so we, we've established a structure which doesn't yet think about the business model. What you can do on that business model, you can think of different types of or different varieties of the business models. You can think of business models being uh, or private entities actually earning money on operating those wallets and uh, uh, adding value added services on top of this assignment of the uh, roles as, or if life allows for that, of course, if the, the governance framework allows for that, you can think of LOUs, which are part of the, uh, of the governance framework at present, and their uh, business potential when, uh, as, as business registers, they can act on, on that. So here, the, the structure allows for a couple of at least different dimensions of the, the business sustainability of that, the financial sustainability of this entire network. It doesn't necessarily need to rely on Glyph. It can actually be decentralized because the way how it is built is there is at present no uh, entity who would gain value from being the governing this, this entire thing. And that, that is, I think, exactly the importance of having a successful implementation of blockchain type of thing. You, you've, you first think about this as decentralized. The business models come from wallet operators, just like in Bitcoin, right? Uh, they, they can add value services, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, Glyph will be the beneficiary of running or, or governing this entire network. We are thinking, for instance, one of the use cases, just to, to, I know we are past time, if you still want to. One more question. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I'm following, I know this is easier, but, you know, basically, you know, the business model is that 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 the business model Yeah. So those two things. Plus one more comment about the uh, you know, roles. There can be multiple roles that a person can play in an organization. It's not just one role. In fact, that is precisely what happens in any organization with signing you know, authorities. Like you know, some some need to be uh, you know some person needs to be different roles, and they can act in different roles. And hopefully, when the wallets become a reality. That person can also hold the wallet which contains, contains that, uh, that verifiable credential, mm. which goes back all the way to life, but also is operable in a use case. Like, you know, we, we are thinking of uh, doing a use case in uh, capital market SIG on CBDC. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that, we need the role of the federal government and a federal reserve and some banks, and we want to model it under life so that the road piece comes from there, uh, then the taxonomy piece comes from the token taxonomy framework for defining the currency, and then the uh, uh, end piece will be inside a hyperledger base or some, or even fabric, where the actual token will be implemented according to a different step. So all of marrying all of these things together to come to a solution. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, come to you for help with the uh, with setting up, like let's say that, that we have the Federal Reserve live, but obviously we cannot change it. We have to have some kind of testing framework where we do that, because mm. otherwise we cannot, we cannot model that piece. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you know, but Carla's uh, background is in standards. She used to chair the ISO Technical Committee 68 Financial Services. I'll, I'll basically... Uh, <laughs> that, that tells a lot about she has a very, very rational and reasonable approach to standardization, which is partially also in our DNA. So I think that this is a very natural step to consider the standardization of the roles. But I think we've exceeded the time. Uh, so thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. <laughs> If you want to, we are available, of course, after.